Praise God. It's confirmation. <laughs> That's confirmation. <laughs> Woo, can't stop God's word. Amen. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this day. Lord, I just pray, God, that you open our hearts and minds to receive your word that you have for us on this morning, Lord. We exalt you, we glorify you, and we lift you up. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 So this morning, um, I'm going to touch on what I would think of as some non-traditional passages that speak into the Christmas story, if you will. And so, <clears throat> next slide, please. The word became flesh and dwelt among us. Amen. And that, that is essentially uh, what we as believers uh, celebrate um, when we look at the Christmas season. It's this celebration of a miracle, this celebration of God entering human history as a human being. Now, the Gospel of John does not have a birth narrative, so to speak, such as Luke or Matthew, but it does begin with a theological prologue, if you will. And he gives, uh, essentially, um, a description of what we would call uh, the incarnation, amen, which is a, a fancy term uh, that simply means God becoming Human. So when you hear people talking about the incarnation of Christ, they're talking about God becoming human. So according to the Harmon Bible Dictionary, I love the way they define the incarnation. They say, God becoming human, the union of divinity and humanity in Jesus of Nazareth. So that is what we celebrate. That is what we meditate upon. God becoming human. The incarnation or God becoming human is an act of sacrificial love. As was mentioned earlier in the worship, God gave his only begotten son to atone for our sins. And I love the way Galatians chapter 4 verse 4 uh, describes uh, this blessing of God becoming human. Galatians 4 Verse 4, it says, but when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law, that we might receive the adoption as sons. God sent his son that we might become sons. Amen, somebody. All right. So I exhort you this season to look unto Jesus. Amen. Don't look unto the Christmas tree, children. Look unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, because everything under the tree will pass away. Perishable. But Christ is forever. Next slide, please. Do you desire the Lord more than any material gifts? Does your holiday observance exalt the Christ of Christmas or selfish materialism and pride? See, the retailers do an excellent job of making, you know that most businesses make all their money around the Christmas season. And they pump it up, they pump it up, but they pump up the aspects of buying and giving gifts. They're not advertising Christ and worshiping him. So we have to be careful. We have to continue to watch and pray because our adversary, the devil, is busy. So as believers, we have to remain vigilant and don't let your guard down. So consider this. Why does a season 
that celebrates God's miraculous manifestation in history trigger depression, suicide risks, and wild or lascivious behavior in some people? If this is supposed to be a time of worshiping Christ and the greatest, one of the greatest events in history, God becoming a human to rescue us. Why is it a season? I, re I remember um, in the human services field and, and in corrections, this time of the year we would always have suicide training and holiday depression training. The devil is busy. He doesn't want to focus on Christ. He wants to focus on all magnify all your other issues and problems. Amen. So we're going to talk a little bit about that. Next slide, please. So the birth of Christ guarantees the believer's victory. Amen. So if you would turn with me to the first book of the Bible, just turn to the front of your Bible, the book of Genesis, the third chapter. Amen. <laughs> and if you can't find it, raise your hand and somebody will help you. Amen. No, I'm just playing. <laughs> so... <laughs> I'm just joking. All right, Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. I like to call this the Christmas prophecy, if you will. Um, so the first mention of the virgin birth of Christ was spoken directly to the serpent in the Garden of Eden. Genesis 3, 15, he says, And I will put enmity, that word means hatred, I will put enmity, or as the young people would say, beef. Yeah, yeah beef. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. And see, the first Christmas prophecy, if you will, this first mention of the virgin birth of Christ, or some will call it the proto-evangelium or the first mention of the gospel is spoken directly to the serpent as a prophetic judgment. God puts hatred between the woman and the serpent because we know the story that the serpent deceived Eve and so uh, God puts hatred between the woman and the serpent and then God puts hatred between the seed of the woman and the seed of the serpent. Right. So we know this is speaking of the virgin birth because biologically women can't produce children by themselves. Women don't have seed. Christ Jesus is the seed of the woman. He bruised the head of the serpent on the cross. Hebrews chapter 2 verse 14 says it this way. Another passage that's talking about God becoming human and why. And as much then as the children have partaken of flesh and blood, he himself likewise shared in the same that through death he might destroy him who had the power of death, that is, the devil. Next slide, please. So for those of you who think that the Bible is fake, is full of fairy tales and legends and talking animals and all this stuff, and this story of two people in a magical garden and talking snakes, the story of Adam and Eve is not a fairy tale with talking animals. Okay? So if you study uh, Genesis chapter 1 and 2 and then look at Revelations 21 and 22, you will see that there's a lot of parallels between the Garden of Eden and the paradise described in Revelations. A lot of parallels. So how we think about the Garden of Eden sometimes causes people, when they don't have an understanding of the continuity of Scripture between the Old and the New Testaments, they don't understand and make erroneous claims about the scripture. There's many parallels between the Garden of Eden and the paradise described at the end of Revelation. Then we notice how Genesis chapter 3, 24 casually mentions these creatures called cherubim. 
Once Adam and Eve got cast out of the garden, it says God placed cherubim at the entrances. Just casually mentions that. Hmm. Notice how Ezekiel 28, 11 through 15 talks about a rebellious cherub that was in Eden, the garden of God. Hmm. Curious. So this serpent is not just a talking snake, as you see in the cartoons and pictures, but it's a non-human intelligent life form. And Revelation 12, 9 identifies the serpent as a dragon, the devil, and Satan. Revelations 12, 9. We're going to go to Revelations a little later, but I do want to share this verse. Revelations 12, 9. It says, so the great dragon was cast out, that serpent of old, or some translations say that ancient serpent, called the devil and Satan, who deceives the whole world. He was cast to the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. So that brings a whole new level to the Garden of Eden story. Oh, and by the way, uh, dragons are real animals, not fairy tale creatures. And I can prove it to you from scripture. You can see me after service and we can talk about it. But just quickly, uh, they were created on day five, right? And there's this creature that's called Leviathan that's described in Job chapter 41. And so uh, Isaiah chapter 27, one is a, is a passage that's very similar to Revelations 12, nine, because just like in Revelations 12, 9, where you see the serpent and the dragon and Satan connected, in Isaiah 27, 1, you see Leviathan, the serpent, and a dragon connected. In that day, the Lord with his severe sword, great and strong, will punish Leviathan, the fleeing serpent, Leviathan, that twisted serpent, and he will slay the reptile that is in the sea. The King James Version says he will slay the dragon that is in the sea. Now, the Hebrew behind that, okay, the word serpent is the same word serpent in Genesis 3. And the word uh, reptile in the sea or dragon, as it's translated in, in um, the King James, is the same word that we find in Revelations 121, where God created the great sea creatures and the fish and the birds. That's the same word that's translated dragon in the King James. So this was a real animal. And then Leviathan is described in Job chapter 41 with a lot of dragon-like creatures. Because why would John describe a mythological being in his vision. There was other terms he could use, but he specifically used this term dragon. So it was a real animal that was around. And some of them might call them dinosaurs. The word dinosaur wasn't invented until the 1800s. But what would they would have been called before that? Oh, and by the way, the earth is a millions of years old, so all the animals was created on day five and six. Amen, somebody. The devil is already defeated, but he is still warring against the saints. Still warring against the saints. Ephesians 6.10. Man, a little Bible study this morning before Christmas. <laughs> Ephesians 16. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Amen. Next slide, please. So now, travel with me to Revelations chapter 12. 
Amen. Oh, I still got a whole hour. No, I'm just playing. <laughs> I know we got the business meeting afterwards, but. Okay. This is the last section, but it's a long section. All right. Revelations chapter 12, verses 1 through 6. Be encouraged. God protects and provides for his people. So as I stated earlier, John does not necessarily include a birth narrative in his gospel account, but he does include one in Revelation. So for those who, may, who do not know, uh, the author of the Gospel of John is also uh, the same apostle who the Lord used to write the book of Revelations. And so the book of Revelations actually includes a narrative of the birth of Christ. Amen. So we generally think of future events when we think about revelation, things that's going to happen, you know, sometime in the future. But sometimes these passages review past events, but through a lens of apocalyptic imagery. So John is having this vision um, where he's caught up into the presence of God and he's seeing things in the spirit. And so he's seeing a lot of events of world history, future, and some past through the lens of apocalyptic imagery. And that simply means just symbolic um, uh, things that have uh, meanings behind them. And sometimes they have many layers of meanings. Amen? Amen. Amen. Revelations 12, 1 and 2. It says, Now a great sign appeared in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, and on her head a garland of 12 stars. Then being with child, she cried out in labor and in pain to give birth. Now that word sign um, is the same word uh, that is used, um, that John uses when he describes the miracles that Jesus performed in his gospel. And he picks out particular signs that he does. But it's a word, um, according to Logos, it means miracle, a marvelous event manifesting a supernatural act of a divine agent, often with an emphasis on communicating a message. So he's seeing this sign. The woman most likely represents the nation of Israel. Now, we know that Mary gave birth to Christ. She was an Israel. She is an Israelite. But this most likely represents the nation of Israel. Romans 9, 5 uh, mentions this, um, where Paul is talking about um, how God used Israel. Um, he says, um, <clears throat> of whom are the fathers, um, well, I'm going to go back. Uh, to verse 3. For I could wish that I myself were cursed from Christ for my brethren, my countrymen, according to, to the flesh who are Israelites, to whom pertain the adoption, the glory, the covenants, the giving of the law, the service of God, and his promises, of whom are the fathers, and from whom, according to the flesh, Christ came, who is over all the eternally blessed God. Amen. So the imagery is similar to the dream that Joseph had in Genesis 37, where he sees this dream of the sun and the moon and these stars bowing to him. And so that similar image of the sun, the moon, and stars is reminiscent of the nation of Israel. Now, this garland she has on comes from a Greek word called Stephanos. Uh, according to Logos, it's, it represents a crown, a wreath, or a diadem worn on the head to signify victory, glory, or prestige. And this is the same word used for the various crowns believers receive. And so, uh, if you are wondering if Mary experienced any labor pain as she was giving birth to the Christ, I will say see verse 2. Um, <laughs> So she cried out in laboring and pain to give birth. Amen. Verses three through four. Um, well, before that, serving God or being used by God does not necessarily mean that you'll have a pain-free life. Amen. Jesus suffered great pain, earning our salvation for us. And persecution is promised to the believers. 
So don't be discouraged or misled that, oh, well, I got saved, and so now my life is going to be just perfect and drama-free. Now, you are guaranteed a pain-free eternity. Amen. 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 All right. Verses 3 and 4 of Revelation 12. It says, And another sign appeared in heaven. Behold, a great fiery red dragon, having seven heads and ten horns, and seven diadems on his heads, his tail threw a third of the stars of heaven and threw them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman who was ready to give birth to devour, to devour her child as soon as it was born. So the traditional nativity stories don't necessarily include uh, the devil standing there at the manger as Mary is giving birth trying to eat the baby Jesus. But again, John is seeing, he's, he's seeing a vision of the past through an apocalyptic lens. God entering history as a human being was part of the warfare strategy to defeat the kingdom of darkness and execute our deliverance. Amen. Jesus came on a rescue mission. Amen. We see that, uh, a hint of that in Colossians 1 uh, verse 13. Uh, he has delivered us from the power of darkness and conveyed us into the kingdom of the son of his love. Then it talks about these uh, diadems that's on the head of the dragon. And we already know that the dragon is, is, the, is representing the devil. Um, the diadems are crowns. Uh, that this word diadems is only used in the book of Revelation three times. Okay? The dragon has, is described as having seven, seven diadems on his head. The beast, or we know as the Antichrist that comes along in, in chapter 11, 13, he has ten crowns or diadems on his head. And guess who else has diadems on his head? Christ. Now how many does Christ has? Revelation 19 says he has many crowns. Too many to count. See, remember the power of the enemy is limited. But the power of Christ is unlimited. He has many diadems. See, see, Satan and Christ are not equal. Not like the one, like the yin yang. There ain't no yin and yang going on. It's a lopsided fight. <laughs> the power of the enemy is limited, but the power of Christ is unlimited. Now, the one third of stars, uh, we know those are fallen angels. Don't be concerned by that because God still has two angels for everyone following the devil. Well, he's still outnumbered. <laughs> two to one. <laughs> to read down, he got whooped on too. But anyway. So the dragon wanted to devour Christ at birth. But if we read on uh, to verse number five, it says... All right. Uh, all right. If I can find myself. Okay. And the dragon stood before the woman who was ready to give birth to devour the, her child as soon it was as soon as it was born. She bore a male child who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron, and her child was caught up to God in His throne. Amen. So the birth was successful. Why? Because the devil can't stop God. The Lord Jesus Christ is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. He is the Prince of Peace who will bring true peace to this chaotic world. It says he will rule all nations with a rod of iron. Where human governments fail, Christ will 
succeed. His kingdom is an everlasting kingdom. There's no votes every four years. No regime changes, no coup details. And so John mentions the birth and he, he goes straight to the ascension of Christ. But in between that, we know Jesus was born. He went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil. He died for our sins according to the scriptures. He was raised on the third day according to the scriptures. And he ascended to the right hand of God. And he's coming back to execute judgment upon the wicked and the only escape is to turn from rebelling against God we call that repentance turn from rebelling against God and place your faith in Jesus as Savior believe he is the atoning sacrifice that means the acceptable payment for your sins and surrender to him as Lord wise preacher once said the safest place to be is in the will of God it is the will of God for you to trust Jesus as Savior and Lord last verse then the woman fled into the wilderness where she has a place prepared by God that they should feed her there for 1260 days so God has a place prepared to protect his people we know that in the end times, Israel will be protected from the devil for the last three and a half years of what's called the Great Tribulation. And so the Christmas story is not just about what can I get? What do I want for Christmas? Again, the birth of Christ, God becoming a human being was an act of warfare to execute our deliverance from death. On December 25th, we celebrate the birth of Christ. And the question for us is, will you worship the Christ of Christmas this year? It will be a tragedy to celebrate Christmas without being in Christ. It will be a greater tragedy to spend eternity separated from God who loves you and share the fate of the devil who hates you. Oh, and a news flash. The devil is not going to be ruling in hell and a big party and like a club and a bar and dancing. And I don't want to be in heaven because it's going to be boring. I'm going to go to, you know, hell where the party going to be. It's not going to be a party. It's going to be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And the devil going to be down there being tormented just like everybody else is going to be there. Amen. I don't want to be nowhere where the devil going to be. If you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Amen.